afternoon, all of you. Good to see you here. And uh, I think some of you are having problems with bandwidth. And I think the monsoon has started in Kerala. So Kerala, and I think it's moving on. So I'm sure you would have difficulties with the internet. But I think it's important to see the face. Particularly this lecture today, we are going to discuss about the mask, the mask cell. Without a face, how can we discuss about the mask? But then that's fine. I'll try my best. But uh, I don't want to just do a monotonous uh, one-way lecture today. I would also like your participation because this whole series is not just on a few lectures, but it is to learn from each other, to share our experiences, and to go through what we went through, perhaps in another mode of sharing and also empathizing, and also perhaps understanding the whole intricacies of it. So, uh, so I, I feel, I see that uh, perhaps 50% of the people do not have videos, or, or maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Um, this is a very interesting topic, and we all have thought about this topic in one way or the other, as artists, performers, uh, writers, health workers, because all of these people whom I just mentioned use the mask. And uh, would you agree with me that then that these these are the only people who use mask? Because the moment we talk about uh, uh, the word mask, we have an idea of a particular. Uh, wearable object on our face, right? So, uh, but is there anything beyond that concept of a wearable object? Just excuse me for one second. There's a lot of noise, so let me just close the door and just give me one second. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm in my office and uh, the first floor, I think there's a lot of activity going on. I was expecting more PhD scholars to be coming soon and the room's getting uh, rectified, I guess. Uh, so the moment we talk about mask, we all have a feeling of a wearable object, right? Most of us think of that way. Uh, but then there's a lot to, uh, understanding the mask. Are you hearing this disturbing noise or are you hearing only my voice? It's a combination of both, ma'am. Uh, of both, okay. All right, so I, I guess that's completely out of my control and please excuse me for that. It is, it is okay, ma'am, it is okay. All right, okay. Um, well, uh, I think I want to bring in, bring into your attention very interesting points from perhaps not just from psychology, but also from performance studies, theater in understanding yeah. the mask. Uh, but uh, let us begin with a little bit of a psychology that uh, most of us use mask. And if you uh, look at the uh, already existing literature on this topic, you would see a lot of uh, analytical approaches to understanding the mask as if uh, you, we wear a different mask every day. A given day, you wear a few uh, different masks and uh, why not be your true self? This is the typical uh, literature which you would see if you do an internet search. Uh, the popular psychology of mask uh, tells you about something which you are not and which you are trying to pretend or trying which you are, you are trying to wear something and you want to prove something else. But I feel uh, the whole concept of mask is much more complex and much more intricate and much more layered. And I think it, it takes a while to, for us to understand this. Now, let's say that uh, we all have very different uh, dispositions to ourselves in a given day itself, because we meet very different people. And when you relate with different people, you respond to different situations. Our dispositions also change, right? the way we talk to a friend and the way we talk to a stranger or the way we talk to our partner at home, these are all very different. 
the way we talk to our son is very different. So our responses are very, very different. So what exactly is happening in that, in that context? We are, we are our true self or we are our self, but we are also adopting different frameworks through which we can relate to uh, the people whom we are responding to. So it is not very, uh, you know, the usual idea in folk psychology, I feel is uh, there is a true, there is something of the true self and there is something of the mask. So the folk psychology will tell you, okay, leave your mask and uh, discover or be your true self. I, I feel it is a little bit of a, a compressed way of looking at this whole idea of self and mask. The mask is much more intricate or the, all the idea of mask itself is not just denoting a very negative point of not being what you are, but in fact, it can be something else as well. It can be adopting a new framework through which you want to represent and re respond to another person. And uh, at the same time, though we adopt very different frameworks uh, to relate to different people, at times, we also feel that we want to be just within ourselves, right? This is why sometimes we see that I want some time for myself. I wish to be on my own. I just want my own time and space. Because at that time and space point of view, you relate to something of your own. You feel that it is your own true self. And at other times, we relate with different people. And then you feel that maybe you are not in your true self or there are certain aspects of yourself which comes through which you're not very comfortable with. So you want to go back and see if there is a true self and if there are uh, very original characteristics of that true self, which you want to again reconfirm and then come back to perhaps an interactive world. So this is also a two way that uh, you need to go back to your inner self and also you need to express yourself very differently with different people or according to different environments. And uh, so interpersonal relations play a, a, a lot in this need, a desire for us to relate with other people as well as our desire to be with, connect with our own inner self. And how do we do this? We of course do this through, as we just said, uh, through interactions, by responding to people. But apart from that, these responses and interactions are also founded on our attitudes, our beliefs, our goals and worldviews. So these also decide uh, how we relate and respond to another person. So our attitudes, beliefs, goals and worldviews play a great role. Now, let me come back to that original idea of mask. And I'm, I'm hoping that all of you are here, people who have the videos on and people who do not have the videos on. I'm hoping they are not doing something else because it's, it's really not a great idea to be logged in and doing something else. And this is something which I have been saying in other classes too, because this is something which has a new feature which you don't see in Zoom or in Team but a feature of this, all these online apps is that you can log in and you need not be seen. But I hope you won't be using that feature and uh, you will be present uh, uh, at this space. Uh, well, the idea of mass also brings, I think, three important uh, functions. Uh, one is the function of authenticity, the whole concept of authenticity. The second is vulnerability. And the third is creative expression. And I think all the three are different sides of what we call as the mask. And uh, let's look at what is authenticity. So the idea is that there is something which is authentic. There is something which is original and, uh, and the rest is not original or the, next, the rest is moving and changing. It is not your true self. So your true self is something which is authentic and the rest, which comes through your mask uh, framework is different. So this is one idea about mask that there is a mask which masks the, your authentic, authenticity or your authentic self. I'm not endorsing any of these views, but I'm just giving you a larger 
analytical understanding of this concept. The second is vulnerability. And again, I think this is very, very interesting. Um, uh, particularly, we understand vulnerability in the context of COVID-19 that uh, uh, almost all of us are vulnerable to getting an infection. And uh, so wearing a mask is very important that uh, we reduce our vulnerability and we protect ourselves. So the idea of vulnerability and protecting oneself as the function of a mask. And uh, definitely this goes, the whole idea of vulnerability goes beyond this. And I think if we, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I was reading somebody else. Uh, so the whole idea of vulnerability also, not only in health context, but also other narratives of uh, gender, uh, you also know about uh, how women wear different kinds of veils and uh, also people arguing about veils as a fundamental right to represent or present their identity. And there has been a lot of discussion on this, uh, whether a state can allow uh, a particular gender to wear a veil or, uh, or even another object such as for your head. Uh, so I hope you understand what I'm saying. So it, a veil which cover your face or uh, uh, an object which um, cover your head, your hair. So these are a lot of uh, religious, uh, uh, what should I say? A lot of religious implications is in there. And but also there is this idea of fundamental right that you present yourself in the way you want. So there's also this dialogue between the state and its uh, citizens or its people as to how to negotiate between um, the, your right to be in the way and the form you want and how freedom is conceived by state. Uh, the third is creative expression. And creative expression, the best understood in uh, when we talk about masks, I don't have to tell you that in special, that's uh, the best place to understand about creative expression and the usage of masks or the deployment of masks in very many ways is of course performance studies, theater and drama. And of course movies too, because there's a lot of very ornate, intricate use of masks in performance studies with various functions. We will go into that a little later. I, I, I have a few ideas to share with you about that particularly. Now, uh, it's also interesting that uh, certain kind of masks or certain usage of masks indicate your lifestyle. And uh, it's not about concealing yourself, but it is revealing. And this is uh, particularly interesting when we uh, see the masks used in parties in Halloween, right? I mean, these are uh, masks which is not to conceal, but to project or to reveal something. And uh, there are also uh, the masks which reveal in a very accentuated manner. So you cover the rest of your face, but you accentuate or you reveal only a particular feature of your face. And, uh, and so there are various ways of revealing your face uh, in, as part of your lifestyle, as part of your festivals and so on. And uh, in performance studies, the mask is a narrative. It is not just an object. The mask is a narrative of not just perhaps an artist, but perhaps the real life stories behind the artist. And there's a reason why I say this, which I want to talk to you about a little later when we come to certain ritual art traditions, particularly, particularly which, uh, something which I am more interested in from Kerala. So there, um, the mask is a narrative. It's not a wearable object. It's not an object which is worn taken off, but it is a narrative uh, about a particular role or a particular hero or a heroine or a character. And uh, the third, I think, uh, um, idea of mask is about security, which is covering and hiding using masks, which I think I, we just discussed about that in the context of COVID-19 that has come as in a very powerful manner that you cover and hide using your mask, your mouth, your eyes, your nose. And these three, I guess, has become very, very important. And I'm sorry, I said eyes, you don't cover your eyes. You cover your nose, 
uh, your mouth, and I guess that's it. Uh, but I, I guess ice need not be covered, but then ice also vulnerable uh, because of this particular, uh, uh, the nature of contagion for this uh, coronavirus. But uh, what is interesting is that here the mask is used for covering and hiding or uh, hiding from the attack of an alien object. So which means mask indicating the security aspect of your personality and your interpersonal relations. Now, another way of looking at mask is what does it help us to do? So, well, I would think that uh, both from the pop psychology point of view and maybe from performance studies and dramas, the masks help us to create illusions, right? And uh, these illusions are sometimes so real that we don't distinguish between the reality perhaps which is shared by a common world and the illusion which are perhaps private to us. And I think theater and drama helps us to understand this power and function of mass to create illusions and to mistake them as realities. Now, not only the mass create illusions, but mass also create realities and uh, transferring that reality to another person or an audience. And again, this is more understood in the context of drama and theater that you create realities using mass. And not only you create it, then you transfer that reality to an audience. So you create uh, a world which is shared with another community of people or in, 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 in terms of theater or drama, your audience. So you create realities and these realities are shared realities. They're not just illusions, they're shared realities. So it's very, very interesting that uh, the function of what we call as mask is, is so uh, varied and they are very, very complex in its nature. Now, apart from creating illusions and realities, on one side it creates, it can create, I'm not saying it always creates, but it could create illusions. And particularly when we adopt roles and labels, perhaps which we are not comfortable with, but your society gives, your family gives, or your friends give, or you yourself give to you. But then you also go beyond these labels and roles which uh, uh, your significant other gives or you yourself give. So you create illusions for yourself, but then you also have the desire or you also have the ability to go past the illusion and to see and create realities. So we travel in between illusions and realities in a daily life if we take. But then it's not only just creating illusions and realities, but we also do something else. And I think that is very, very important. And uh, perhaps that is where the whole idea of Sutradhara, the wearer of the mask, at least in Indian uh, aesthetics, uh, come in a very interesting manner, that uh, the Sutradhara helps you to touch a point of transcendence, which is neither the space of illusion not the space of reality, but a space of transcendence. And the transcendence which transcends both the illusion and the reality. So it is not just a binary of the illusion and the reality, but also a point which you still have not discovered, but is as a possibility which invites you. So to discover and connect with transcendence, something which is beyond the illusions and realities, for that also we need an intermediary the mask wearer, uh, sometimes called a sutradhara. And uh, I'm sure all cultures or different literatures have, would have several similar concepts. Now, I want to come back to uh, a very important uh, psychological and philosophical idea about mask. And uh, there's a lot of literature in it. And if you would go through some of the journals, you would see technical papers. And to some extent, you would see pop psychology also not much on what I'm going to uh, tell you in a moment. And this is about uh, the functions of self-deception and self-discovery connected with mask. So what is self-deception? Self-deception is 
defeating oneself or uh, defeating oneself in her or his uh, desire to be oneself. So self-deception is, how can you deceive oneself? I mean, you may ask, I may ask, how can you deceive oneself? Can we ever deceive oneself? Yes, we can deceive oneself. Uh, self-deception comes when, uh, when the clarity about ourselves is less, and when there are also outside forces which may not allow us to be freely expressing ourselves or outside, uh, uh, what should I say, reasons which do not allow us to be what we are. So you self, you deceive yourself and uh, you enact in particular ways in your day-to-day -day relations. So, um, in, in such a process of self-deception, what's happening, what happens is that in, instead of connecting to your larger self or your true inner self, and, and I'm assuming there is an inner self, because at the end of the day, we all can go to our private space and think, what am I? And I guess we all are capable of that. And I'm, I, I don't think any one of us is bereft of such a capability, because that is the very, uh, fact of being a human, that is, that we can introspect even if it is in a very small degree. So when self-deception happens, that is, you deceive yourself, you act according, not to according to your thinking, your beliefs, but, uh, but something which the society, uh, impo uh, yes, the society forces upon you or uh, tells you that this is how things have to be or uh, your family or your community. I'm saying society in a larger uh, space, but it can be just small, you know, group of people who are around you that they could be your friends, you could be your family members, your teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you, you, you end up in deceiving yourself, but then you also uh, post yourself as something else because you do not want perhaps a friction or you don't want uh, things to be not so uh, uncomfortable to everybody with whom you're relating. And in such a stage, instead of expanding yourself, yourself shrinks, yourself becomes smaller and smaller, narrower and narrower and thinner and thinner. There's a shrinking self. But then this is one side. The other side is of self-discovery. The different role models we put, the different labels which we put or others put on us, allow us to discover various aspects of our own self which was hidden until that moment. So, so I, I feel again, this is a two-sided thing. On one side, you might say that you, uh, what, you, what we do is deceiving yourself by not being your true self. But on the other hand, you could also say that perhaps you give a chance to, for you to discover yourself by uh, perhaps relating to a larger community around you and uh, also perhaps connecting to their hearts and selves and understanding what their needs, etc. And in that sense, you are more a purpose oriented rather than uh, just little self-oriented, which I'll talk to you perhaps in another class about the narcissist self, because both involves a self-directing, a direction to oneself. But in one case, yourself, which is a shrinking self, which you try to relate. The other is a larger expanding self, which you try to relate, which makes you also purpose-oriented and a self which includes more, which is nourished more, which is watered more. And in the earlier case, the, the self gets less water, less nourishment, and it doesn't grow. In fact, it shrinks, shrivels, and one day it dies off. And at that point, you become something completely different. And we don't want to talk about that at this point. But it's very interesting that the whole idea of personality also has something to do with the mask. Persona itself has some connotation about having a mask or being a mask. So personality perhaps is a mask to self. That, what does that mean? That means the self is something completely authentic sitting somewhere and then you're putting up something with. 
I'm not sure that's the way to look at it. The way to look at it is perhaps we relate in very different ways and the true self is a kind of a large source of nourishment which we can take at times and then we express ourselves. So the idea of personality itself is um, uh, perhaps dependent on the way we rela relate to people, the way we respond to others and uh, the way we understand each other. So it's very interesting to look at how personality develops, how personality uh, changes over a period of time in the context of understanding the mask. Now, uh, let's look at mask as a covering of the face. When we talk about mask, the very first idea, at least to commoners, come is that mask is for the face, right? Is the mask, the face is masked. So there's a concealment of the face and uh, why the face is very important in our culture, or perhaps not, I'm not just talking about Indian culture, but perhaps most of the cultures, I wouldn't say all the cultures, but most of the cultures perhaps existing in today's earthly life, uses or accept the face as a very important organ to convey your feelings to others, to connect yourself with the other and to connect the other with you. The face seems to be a, a kind of a launcher of uh, your emotions and uh, your need to connect with another person. And uh, so here the faces as a whole, not just the eyes, not just the eyes, but the face as a whole. So as a culture, we relate, uh, we interpret and understand through the face. So we see faces. We may not talk about it, right? I mean, as a very refined, sophisticated uh, societies we are in now, we don't talk about what we learn from the face, but on, in a day-to-day -day manner, we all get influenced by faces, right? Uh, that's why sometimes we, we, people say that, oh, he just had a cold face when I said this, right? Uh, so faces seems to be also responding uh, to our emotions and faces also seems to be a mirror about how the other person receives what you uh, try to share. The face becomes a mirror. The face becomes a microcosm for your world and the world of the other person whom you try to contact. So when a mask is worn by a face, what happens is the focus is on the eyes because the eyes are not uh, closed or at least the eyes are not fully closed even if there are you know, ways of wearing masks which your eyes open to a certain extent. But uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, the focus becomes on the eyes and the rest of the face is concealed. So what you can say that there is a flattening of rest of uh, that space through which you were connecting with the other. So it becomes a flattened space rather than a multidimensional space. And uh, there is a flattening of that very intricate very layered uh, relationship which you had, which uh, you try to also invoke in interpersonal relation. And it becomes a flattened space, which is conveyed or focused only in the eye. And uh, there's also a boundary which is created between you and the other. So in a, such a context, when the face is concealed and only the eyes are revealed, it also conveys in, in a nonverbal fashion that there is a boundary between you and me and that boundary I'm carrying with that boundary, I'm wearing this boundary and everybody creates the distance uh -huh. which is uh, comfortable for them uh, by using this boundary between you and the other person. Uh, mask, in that sense, we can, say that it's a tool which has the control to reveal and express ourselves. So in the context of COVID-19, we were, we not wear, we are being asked to wear masks. One is to protect uh, ourselves, right? To protect ourselves from perhaps the 
the contagion, the contagion to spread or to prevent the spreading of the virus or the contacting of uh, the pathogen to us. But, uh, but then there is something else also. We also wear the mask as a respect for the right of the another person not to be infected. And I think this is very, very interesting. Many people think that we are wearing masks for ourselves to protect ourselves in a sense, not to be contaminated. But then mask is also worn to express your respect to the fundamental right of another citizen not to be infected, not to be infected. So you wear the mask so that you respect the other person's uh, need and desire that he or she should not be infected. And I think this also is very, very interesting. So in that sense, mask also has an intersubjective space. It is not just a first person uh, space which is created, but it's an intersubjective space that not only that you are aware of your own need of not to be infected, but you also respect the other person's uh, fundamental right of not to be uh, infected. Now, if you look at the mass of COVID-19, and that is an area which is uh, of a great amount of creativity which is happening, different kinds of masks come every day, right? Every day we have different colors, different uh, textures, different materials, and uh, different functions also. But uh, essentially, the masks of COVID-19 are not supposed to be of a cre creative function. We, know, we don't wear those masks to show a creativity of the artist, nor as a uh, part of a fashion or a style statement. Essentially, uh, they are of some other function, and they are not of artistic, performance-oriented uh, function. These masks which we wear in COVID-19 time is not as part of a performance which we do. It is not as part of a creative uh, uh, expression which we are trying to do, but it is meant for something else. And uh, it is also not meant for veiling and unveiling, which is not to show yourself to some people at some point and to show yourself to some people at times. So you veil your face to some people, you unveil your face to someone else, no. In COVID-19 times, the mask is not worn for that, but it is worn to signify illness and protection and uh, common people and health workers. So mask is a symbol of illness. It is a symbol of protection. It is also a symbol of common people who have the right to be protected. It also symbolizes the health workers because in, in, a, in a symbolic manner, it also tells you about uh, uh, the whole gamut or the whole scenario of health workers uh, to the paramedics who work day in and day out to take care of uh, the people who are infected or who may be infected, who have the chance of infected or uh, who are recovering. Now, uh, I want to now go back to uh, a point which I tried to share in the beginning. And that is about performances, because that is where we see the entire um, possibility of mask. So we see mask in performances, plays and dramas, festivals, movies, dem demonstrations, masquerades. And uh, we also have uh, very, very interesting ideas about mask uh, in movies as well. And I think I'm going to talk, uh, tell you about one movie, and I don't think any one of you would have missed it. If you miss it, if you had missed it by any chance, please go and watch it. And this is the movie of Jim Carrey's A Mask. I myself, I have seen it four times. Because every time I see, I stop laughing at the way he would laugh. And he is one person who need not do anything else as to make us laugh, right? He just have to just look at us. Just give a glance, and we don't know why we just burst into laughter. I am sure if anyone of you have not seen that movie, please see The Mask and also the other movie, which is The Son of Mask, right? Both the movies you should see because both were very interesting. And uh, uh, 
And it's very interesting that uh, you see two portrayals of Jim Carrey uh, in, I forget the name uh, of the mask, the other person's uh, name. Um, okay, anyway, so uh, so there are two personalities which he, which he portrays. One is, uh, uh, yes, Stanley, thank you, Abhishek. Yeah, so Stanley as uh, this very dominant uh, personality, even he, the mask, when he wears the mask, you know, he is the all powerful in the world and uh, he has his girlfriend or his wife uh, who loves him and he has all the creative projects coming to him and then he, he can do what is undoable, uh, undoable or there is nothing impossible for him. Uh, but then without the mask, Stanley is a very ordinary person, very lazy guy very demotivated, has no interest in life, has no conviction about himself. All his projects are a failure and he himself doesn't believe that success is possible for him. So there is this portrayal of two Stanleys in the whole movie, uh, you know, when he gets out of the mask and then he's masked. So this is very, very interesting. And some people even talk about this movie in terms of uh, some of the Freudian ideas which I discussed. I don't know how much it is uh, relevant to that movie, but it's very, very interesting that uh, if we have to understand in terms of repression or multiple possibilities of the self, this movie is a very, very uh, interesting movie, very nicely made and uh, it will never disappoint you. And now I think it's something which is very important about this movie. Uh, I think the first part, the mask is, uh, uh, the, finally, I think the uh, Stanley throws the mask, right? He throws into the river and he goes back to his home and he thinks the mask is gone, right? The mask is gone and it will never come back to you. But this is something which is very, very interesting. Can you really throw away the mask? It's a very important question we have to ask because even if you throw away the mask, the mask will come in search of you because there's a relation between you and the mask not the relation between two entities, but these are very intricately connected relation. Maybe there's a, a blood and flesh connection between you and the mask. And uh, so even if you leave the mask, the mask may not leave you and it comes back. And I'm also uh, reminded of this other movie, uh, Jumanji. And I think there are many other movies which this idea gets repeated that uh, what you want to throw away will not go away, but it will come back. You remember that box with that magic box uh, in Jumanji, he's thrown finally, but then again, two fishermen find it, right? And we don't know what happens after that. So, so there is a rela certain relationships which we form with uh, so-called foreign entities or with so-called perhaps alien entities, which we may want to give up at some point, but then we don't know. It may not be that easy to give up and that it comes back to us. And, uh, and I think if Jim Carrey's The Mask and The Son of the Mask was more of a comic and comedy nature as a movie to tell us these ideas about The Mask, the most serious movie was The Joker, right? And I'm hoping at least some of you would have seen the movie of Joaquin Phoenix which gave him the uh, Best Actor Award. And uh, it's, a, it's a dystopic movie. I mean, there's a lot of um, unpleasantness, violence, and uh, difficult sceneries and scenes uh, for a common viewer who goes for an entertainment uh, when he, uh, he or she watches the movie. So the Joker, in fact, uh, if you look at his trajectory of life. First of all, he lives with a disease which he cannot control, which is that he just bursts into laughter and it is not caused by a cause. And this can be misinterpreted by the society that the laughter is about them who is at that point sitting in front of him. But it is not about them, but it is its own uh, inability to control something which he has born with or he has gained in the process of living. So, so he wears, a, 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 I guess, a, a, a banner or something, right? And then he wears that and 
informs people I, I do have a disease. And uh, so this is something which he goes through. Again, I'm forgetting the name of uh, Joachim in, in the movie. Uh, uh, so he wears, he wears different uh, costumes. He, as a stand-up comedian, he tries to perhaps integrate with his disease, with his inability. Uh, and he tries to make that inability as an ability to make people laugh. But then at some point, he is unable to bridge between uh, his disease and his, his capabilities as perhaps a comedian, as a, perhaps a comedian uh, who can make really people enjoy and have a good laughter. And uh, he goes into a series of difficulties in life where reality and illusion divide is blurred and uh, he misinterprets people, he misinterprets scenes, he misinterprets himself and he locks himself in a space from which he cannot come. I don't want to go into the detail of the movie, but I'm sure you would have seen it, how a self-enclosed entity uh, uh, he becomes. And not only that, because of the difficulty of uh, uh, giving up his disease or his disease of uh, uncontrollable laughter without any causes, uh, he has to perhaps go into the shadow side of that, which is of extreme violence and uh, also self-justification of perhaps the difficulties which he faced in life. So he has to alienate himself from his near and dear ones and at some point he confuses what is the mask which he wears and what is he really in. And I think in, 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 in this movie, there's a lot of discussion which can, we can have in, uh, sorry, in terms of whether you have a true self or whether you have a self which is portrayed for somebody else. And, uh, uh, I think uh, some of these movies, I don't want to go into more movies, but I'm sure you would have a few movies to talk about as well. But uh, it's very interesting that movies and theatrical performances makes an extravaganza of this wearable object called the mask. And it gives sometimes new dimension which uh, touches our personalities and which analyzes our own mind in a very poignant manner. Now, let us leave the performances and movies for a while and let, let's come back to uh, another, maybe more simple ways of understanding the wearable mask. Why do we wear a mask? And before I ask that question, most of us, or at least until now in this one hour lecture, we have discussed about mask as a wearable entity, which we cover our face or reveal our face, right? As for the face. But then how about clothes? The clothing which we wear. I mean, if you are talking about external entities, the clothing where we wear, can that be called as mask? Can that be called as expressions? Because that again, in theater and performances, you see how clothing and how textile, how, uh, those kind of properties become an extension of yourself and talk more about yourself to another person. And uh, sometimes these allow us to gain a new role and highlight the social role, particularly in performances, in theaters. Uh, the mask or the, the, the properties which we behold with us, the, uh, the costumes which are worn, gives us a new role. And it also highlights the social role which we have. Because uh, I, again, as you know, that in theater, the costume is so important because costume is also indicating of a social role or a role in a very highlighted manner because we don't have so much time to narrate the story. So the costumes become so important that it, it almost becomes a uniform to con con convey from where you come and where you will be going. Now, uh, in a sense, you can say that uh, the mask allows you to relate with more people. If we don't have any mask, if we don't have different frameworks to relate with, if we only have the boring true self, which we don't know what really is, right? 
we all think that we have a true self we don't know where that true self is where that he or she is sitting we don't know but we believe there must be a true self but imagine if we have a true self alone we only have a true self and we don't have any other frameworks or any other windows to look through or the clothes with which we wear and relate with people the roles which we uh, adopt and relate if we don't have that imagine how boring the life would be because it will be such a flattened unidimensional space with which we will be relating so to relate with more people uh, it's also important that uh, we give up or maybe i should not say give up perhaps we keep that notion of the purity of the self aside for a while and then also perhaps explore a little more i'm not saying that a pure self is not there at any point i'm not saying yes or no but uh, uh, in our exploration for a pure self or an authentic self let us not undermine <coughs> the other frameworks which we use in our day to day uh, life the mask also allows us to gain status and recognition and these masks are the masks which we wear in our relationships in psychological uh, the, the psychological underpinnings of relationships and uh, uh, also perhaps uh, not just in relationships and that is why you know children are asked to wear uniforms in schools right and uh, certain people are you uh, asked to wear uniforms in hospitals health workers wear uniforms um, so different people also have been given uniforms and that is uh, when you wear a uniform you gain a particular status or you are being recognized there is a recognition which comes to you and you gain a label as well there is a labeling which happens as well and uh, societies cannot exist without labeling and labels are so important for people to connect with each other now the masks also allow us to connect the different phases of uh, historical times and travel through these times so and uh, there are many movies which uh, tells us about these but i don't want to go into this but uh, the masking which we do also helps us to connect with different phases of time and that is why i think the notion of pure self comes back that the self the, the true authentic self is not an a self which is enclosed and sitting somewhere behind but the self is also connecting with different phases of your life different time lines time zones which you pass through in your life and uh, it gives space for yourself to travel so it's very interesting that the true self is also the self which travels all throughout it gives a space and time for you to travel now uh before i come to an end perhaps of this discussion i want to talk about uh something else which is again going back to perhaps performances but maybe more specifically of ritual arts from kerala because that's one area which i am uh, very interested and uh, we also have some projects going on there so i'm sure this is uh, available in other states and other art performances as well but this, for me i have little more information or knowledge about what i'm going to talk about so we also know about the mass of kathagali and uh, other related forms and we also know the mask of kumatikali the malayalis are here they would know what is meant by kumatikali kumati in fact there was a famous movie by g aravindan called kumati which won the national award so kumati is uh, supposed to be this person who can uh, scare you and who comes and visits your village once in a while so he can wear uh, the uh, the mask of a dog the mask of another animal and uh, whatever he feels like so he brings in a scare as well as he removes a scare from the community and there are very different notions of uh, this kumati and uh, again one another movie from malayalam is a movie called odian uh, by mohan lal if malayalis are again they will know so there uh, uh, the odian wears the mask of a, a buffalo and he he can wear the mask of many different animals but mostly 
relating to the cattle and the buffalo. So by wearing that mask, he also gains the power and the abilities of the animal. So it's very interesting, the relation between the human and the animal by wearing the mask of the animal and you gain the powers of the animal. And uh, so there is uh, not only a satire uh, here in adopting a mask, which belongs to another species, but there is also a role taking and role becoming. So you not only take the role, but you become the role which you have taken. And this is where, where there is obliteration of the self, of the mass self or the true self. And that such an obliteration continues to happen. It's not that we sit uh, you know, one fine evening and try to uh, distinguish between the true self or the mass self, which is the obliterated self, because we don't know in what kind of networks that connection between the authentic self and the express self has formed. And uh, in uh, performances like Kathagali and other uh, performances from other states, and also in Teyam, the ritual arts of Teyam, masks are not only really worn, but masks are also written or drawn on the face. The face carries the mask, which is uh, very ornate, which can be very intricate, uh, with uh, very predefined uh, rules and guidelines on the on the drawings which you wear on the uh, on your face, so it is not only that the mask is worn. Because why I wanted to share this is most of us think that a mask is worn. When a mask is drawn on your face, it is not something which you can take away. It is it becomes part of you. The only thing you can perhaps rub it off. But then that also is not very easy. And so there is a difference between the worn mask and the drawn mask, a mask which is worn and a mask which is drawn on your face and your body at times. And uh, particularly when we come to Teyam and uh, uh, other similar arts in Kerala, uh, the idea is that there is a connect which is formed between the subaltern or the underprivileged and the, the so-called upper class and the so-called privileged uh, people who enjoy more uh, leashes and pleasures in life. So it's very interesting. And if you have not read about the ritual art forms of Teyam, maybe you should read it because they're very, very interest, interesting stories. So in these performances, uh, the subaltern, the Teyam artist, who is otherwise comes from uh, a less privileged community, gains a new importance, gains uh, a new status by becoming the vehicle for the upper class to connect to a transcendental realm. It's very interesting that the subaltern representation of the, sub the representative of the subaltern community is inevitable for the connect to happen between the God and the so-called upper class. So many of the, uh, these artists in the performances become oracles in uh, predicting or in uh, advising you on what kind of healing you can do for a particular disease and what can cause a change in your family, et cetera. So, so he becomes the oracle by wearing the mask of the God. So in these cases, the mask is worn of the God of a of a supernatural entity. And he not only really wears the mask, he becomes the mask. And that is why um, in most cases, they go into a trance or they go into an altered uh, state of consciousness and becomes the connect uh, for the other people, the family who, is, who has organized this performance to connect with the God and to tell them what, what they need to be doing in their life next. So, so it's interesting to look at uh, mask in very, very different ways. And uh, I think it's very important that we look at mask not as just wearable objects alone. Uh, so to begin with, can we look at clothing, textiles, textures as different kinds of masks which we wear? And going from those kind of material, tangible objects, how about intangible uh, 
entities with which we relate, such as traditions and rituals. Our traditions and rituals which we form, can those be addressed as masks, frameworks for us to relate with other people? Can a ritual which we perform, can that be called as a mask which we wear, we become something else, or we try to connect with some other dimension? Uh, so I think unless the mask, the whole phenomenon of mask is understood in a very intricate, very varied manner, we will be bored with the mask which we are given during the COVID-19 times. If we have to make the mask of the COVID-19 times, a very interesting mask, I think the phenomenon of, of mask has to be understood. At the same time, wearing the mask is very important as well. I'm not saying that throw away your mask, but let us wear the mask properly as it is being guided. But let us also understand every time where we mask, that the mask is a very complex object. It is not just a three-layered cloth or a W95 or any of those medically termed uh, objects, but it's a very, very interesting uh, phenomenon. And uh, if we do that, if we can bring in the mask as a very living entity in our life, then we will not see the mask as an entity for some people to control others or for some people to be controlled. And uh, uh, so bringing that entity just as a, a, an object of state machinery, but we can do something else with that, which is to contemplate and self-discover. So I think the mask is perhaps the most potential positive tool we have in COVID-19 times, because it leads us to more and more contemplation it leads us to more and more self-discovery. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, if anyone has any questions. I think there are a few comments. Can you read that out? Yes, ma'am. Or, or people can just talk about it if they, that, I think I prefer that. Yeah. Uh, you may please raise your hands. I can unmute you or, and mute yourself after and speak directly. Yeah, so much. Uh, good afternoon, all. It's quite interesting and it uh, opened up many new uh, dimensions of uh, Can you spotlight uh, the person when he is speaking? Uh, whoever is speaking, can you spotlight? Yeah. Ah, good afternoon, ma'am. It's quite interesting and uh, it actually opened up uh, many new dimensions to our uh, current understanding of mask. Uh, the last point which you made actually, uh, to me as uh, of an individual, uh, it, it actually a new thing. Traditions and our rituals, can those also be uh, treated as masks of uh, some kind of platforms to receive and uh, deal with the uh, people? Uh, that, that's an interesting thing. Uh, that's my observation, point one. Uh, if I may to uh, add uh, some points for further discussions, uh, am I approved? Uh, firstly, uh, yesterday in another different context, uh, uh, I was reading uh, Mahabharata and the Ajnatavasa of uh, Pandavas, we are all familiar with. Uh, can that uh, incognito existence be considered as a mask uh, is my question. Uh, similarly, uh, we have heard in our traditions in many stories in which uh, various uh, deities and uh, uh, devatas uh, appearing in the guise of uh, different uh, forms altogether. Can those disguised uh, existence we also considered as mask uh, traditionally, perhaps I'm not so sure. This is a question to you to uh, reflect. And the thirdly, uh, again from the Indian traditions, the story of uh, Yayati, in which uh, that age-old uh, king wants to uh, discard his If he lost it, Naharika, I can't hear him anymore. Ma'am, even I can't hear him. I think there is some network issue on okay. his side. Well, um, well, maybe we'll respond to him a little later. So anybody else? Anybody else would like to share their thoughts or uh, 
Yeah. Ma'am, uh, Anurag. There was. Okay. So, Ms. Shikha, sir. There's some problem in the connectivity. It got disconnected in between. Yeah, that's fine. I yeah, think I, mean, uh, I heard you. And, uh, thank you for your question. And uh, uh, I think my goal in this lecture was to motivate you to look at various yeah. interpretations for uh, an otherwise a unidimensional flat object called the mask. So the interpretation of the mask can be brought in relations in um, different frameworks which we adopt in our life, in our daily life and in epics as, as well. So yes, I agree with you, uh, Mr. Somshaker, that uh, it depends a whole lot on our creative exploration. Yeah, thanks. The, the last part I was uh, uh, asking it in between it got disconnected. I was uh, telling yeah, you. I, I didn't, hear you. I didn't hear you. Maybe we'll come back okay. to you. Maybe we'll come back okay. to you. Maybe we'll have a few others to talk as well. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, there are some comments on the chat. Okay, I think I did read the comments. Um, yeah, Mr. Raghavan, why don't you talk about that comment? I hope you have a voice. Yeah, Can you spotlight it, uh, Nikarika? Yes, ma'am. I mean, I'm clearly, I mean, you did mention about clothing, and I guess uh, tattoos and belly buttons in some shape or form. I mean, people who probably don't. Uh, see freedom in their real life or want to portray some revolution, I guess uh, tattoos and belly buttons would fall under masking. And of course, on a lighter note, just to, because I know uh, the conversation is pretty serious and I don't want to trivialize it, but I thought, uh, you know, from all this mask, the hint that I took was that Professor Somshekhar probably needs to wear instead of plain blue masks, some design printed ones of either Dr. Rajkumar or Rajnikant or something like that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rakhavan. And uh, I don't know whether uh, Mr. Somshekhar want to respond to it or maybe we will we'll just take it. I think he's smiling to what you said. <laughs> you can definitely see a smile on his face. Yeah, well, well, well taken, uh, Mr. Ragman's uh, uh, comment on that. But uh, I cannot uh, uh, you know, I mean, offer a mask of Rajnikanth or Rajkumar. I try to be more ample. All right. Who else? Comfortable with uh, what I am right now. Okay, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, Ma'am, there are two comments on the WhatsApp chat because of uh, the poor connectivity. They couldn't type it here. Okay. Yeah. One is by Anuradha. She said that the difference between the worn and drawn mask and living behind it made a lot of meaning. Very deep session. Uh, the other is by Samhita. She's, uh, she's saying mask can also create reality. Profound. How much we are in control and how much free uh, will we possess in something to propound. And uh, I, if anyone has any question, they may please raise their hands or unmute themselves and speak. Or you can also type it in the chat so I can read it out. Yeah. Uh, Preeta has asked a question, so maybe I'll briefly answer that. Yes. Could the body be considered as a mask for the soul or inner self? Uh, well, it's a very difficult question, uh, and I think that was the binary which I was trying to respond in this discussion. That uh, whether the body is inner or outer, and the self is inner or outer, because the self, the inner self, the self which is inner, you see the outer expression of that self in our day-to-day -day life activity. That's the person who is interacting with the world, with the body and the mind as well. And uh, perhaps you can say that the true self of the body and the mind is an inner self, which we cannot see as it is, because the moment you see, try to see the self, inner self, you already out, uh, exteriorize the inner self, because the very act of seeing 
itself is an exterior external activity. So I think that is the conundrum uh, which is residing in that, that, uh, uh, that the inner self, the moment, the moment we try to relate with it or to understand as it is, we have already exteriorized it. So in that sense, you can say that uh, the, the body and the mind are expressions of the inner self rather than the mask of the inner self because both are trying to relate with each other and both comes from the same home. Ma'am, there's uh, one question um, by Rachna. How desirable is it to be able to look beyond mask? Our I, own I, I see Dr. Regina here. I'm sure she, it is Regina Bangovakar, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, she, I'm sure she will be able to. Dr. Yes. Regina. Nice to see you after a very long time. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I was just wondering, uh, you know, uh, cognitive uh, developmental theory tells us that children are not able to distinguish between uh, masks uh, and the person behind it. And so very often when we are telling stories to very young children uh, by dramatizing, for example, uh, we avoid masks because they, they might get scared or something. And so along the way, when we grow up, we learn and uh, we are almost always taught to say, oh, no, no, there's something more beyond the mask. Why don't you, you know, don't be so innocent. Don't be so gullible. So I was just, uh, this thought came to my mind that, uh, you know, how desirable is it to look beyond every mask that is presented to us? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a very, very interesting uh, comment. And uh, I don't have any particular response because I perhaps I would also like to think along with you and perhaps understand uh, the whole scenario better. Thank you, Dr. Uh, there are two more questions, ma'am. Two participants have raised their hands. Okay. Amritavalli, I see. And who's and, the other person? Uh, Krishna, see. Who's that? Krishna, see. Okay. So maybe first we'll go to Krishna and uh, then Amrita Valli. Hi, uh, Krishna here. Uh, I really enjoyed the session. And uh, my question is that, you know, there are people who have, uh, let's say, multiple personality disorders or things like that, where they end up believing that they are someone who they uh, may not be or they may even have uh, two, three, or ten different types of personalities which they'll change through in a day, or identities rather, which they'll change through in a day. Are they wearing masks, or uh, is that who they really are? And what's going on over there in terms of masks? Uh, well, I think it's, it's a bit difficult to answer that question because uh, the moment you are, are aware of a mask, then you are not one of those personalities among the multiple personalities you mentioned, because then you distinguish yourself from what you are. So the whole difficulty or the whole, the whole situation in multiple personality uh, situations are that, that we just be, it's difficult for us to distinguish between the different personalities which we are capable of while going through one because we are fully with each one of that. But, uh, but apart from the clinical situation of multiple personalities, I think if we take in a day-to-day -day life situation that we all, we can be a very different person, right? We also say in common parlance, oh, he was a very different person today. What does that mean? Means that he has the potential or the capability or she has the potential or capability to respond in a completely different manner from what he or she has been responding previously in the earlier times. So, so I think, I think that, that positive aspect also will be very interesting. Uh, that uh, the different frameworks, the different, if at all we say different personalities which we may have or which we may project in day-to-day -day life allows us to express in very different manners. It also allows the other person to relate to in very, very different manner. So there are more people will be, who will be able to relate with you and you will be able to relate with more 
different people. But at the end of the day, the problem comes, the end of the day, uh, when we are able to distinguish from all the roles which we are taken and oneself. So the question is, is there a oneself? Is there a pure self? from all the selves or all the roles which we are taken. So, so that is, a, I think, a different question which perhaps we have to discuss in another forum, that uh, if we have a true self, what is the nature of that true self? It is, of course, a space of immense creativity, potentiality, capability, and possibility. So I think this groundedness in, in a deeper awareness and consciousness is very, very important uh, if we are talking in the context of different projections of our own self given a day. Because otherwise it can become a clinical situation. If you are grounding ourselves in a deeper consciousness, in a deeper awareness, then it becomes a play which will be helpful for us and for others also. So the, the thin light line between the play and a clinical, con clinical condition has to be carefully distinguished, I think. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, ma'am, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I don't have a question as such, but I do have three comments that uh, your talk inspired. So one was when you said you mentioned the movie Joker. So the Im immediate thing that came to my mind was superhero movies, because that's like an opposite of what you said. You, the superhero is a normal person by day, but the moment he puts on his cape, Superman becomes, you know, the savior of the world. And he's able to do all of these actions that he can't do as a journalist or a reporter, which is his daily job. And that, in, in fact, that kind of mirrors what you talked when you said what you spoke about ritual arts and this idea of getting possessed. Even in uh, Mandor in Karnataka and the Malnad region, there is this uh, ritual art form called the Kola. So in that's it's just, nearly all the ideas are, are the same as what you said. There is a uh, the the. The medium goes, has to go through this process of painting his entire body and he wears a different uh, attire. But the, the moment the last uh, streak of paint is completed, just after that process, he gets into the trance. So that is what, that, that's the point of difference from being himself versus being uh, someone that is channeling spirits. In, in Mango, they considered uh, the, the actor, the player to have channeled the derivas of the spirits that they uh, pay obeisance to. So that was something that's interesting. Uh, and my, yeah, the second comment I had was when you spoke about uh, just COVID-19 and the masks we wear. I don't know if this is the experience of everyone here, but when I walk out now when you know, you see people with masks, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a jarring experience. It's not, that is, you, you, you actually feel the, the, the distance that you feel from someone else. Even if you have a conversation, you're wearing a mask and you have a conversation with someone who is, it, uh, it is, uh, it feels like there's a block in the communication that there are things that cannot be said or cannot be understood. But in that point of view, when you said um, part of the reason I'm wearing a mask is not just for myself, but to protect the other person. If we had that conception, if I had that thought in my mind when I'm surrounded by other people who are wearing masks, then maybe I will not feel so distant from them, but more closer to them. Because I know, you know, they care for my well-being and that is this is a baseline for all the conversations and interactions that we're having. So it's, that was just my two pence. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. All right. I think uh, there are no more comments. I think we'll take some more time to contemplate uh, on the whole beholder of the mask, the holder of the mask. And also, I think this interesting idea of the Sutradhara, who travels as very, very, very different spaces. And he alone has the power to travel across time zones and has uh, ability to be in touch with all kinds of people in, uh, in, in a performance, if you see. So this idea of Sutradhara, which is the holder of that one thread, which can go to different time zones, the otherwise which realities which are very distinct and demarcated. So what is this idea of Sutradhara? I think it's also a very uh, interesting point. Because when you talk about mask, uh, it, it's of course an English word, 
and of course definitely it has implications in all of our life but uh, rather than seeing the mask as just an object can we also give life and blood to that mask like perhaps in an example of sutradhara who traverses different time zones and understand the phenomenon and life behind the mask perhaps in a much more complex and layered manner thank you very much thank you ma'am